We're very excited to have uh, Jens Jakobsen to speak about uh, Greco-Bactrian, Indo-Greek coins and chronology. Jens is an independent scholar from Sweden and has published extensively on these coins. Uh, very much. Uh, I'm just going to say that the title I chose, an introduction to Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek history and coinage, it's a bit wide. What was was I thinking? I don't think that ma- all of you need this introduction, but I will make a few like landings on certain times in the chronology, and I will actually be so bold as to present a very, very tentative uh, chronology, which is just a suggestion. This can't be easily read, but its images is fa- actually Pankaj's uh, site, Coin India, mostly. And we have some... Uh, other ones from Wikipedia, Oliver Bourdieu and uh, Arthur Horton and the lot uh, from Silicon Coins. And uh, C.A. Bershan Kapadia has a coin too that he wants to show us. And uh, some tables from Bobby Arachi. And I have left uh, a link here to uh, Dr. Simon Glenn's uh, list with all the references. So I don't have to repeat them uh, in full in the, in the presentation. But they are all there. And uh, it, apart from all, to thank all those people, I also want to thank uh, Professor Frank Holt and Brad Bowlin and Mark Passel, not the least, uh, and many others. Uh, I hope I don't forget. This is the chronology that I very, very tentatively am trying to, um, well, discuss. And you see that I start Bactria's uh, coinage from 246 BC. And I started with a king called Diodotus I, and then the second, and then the third king, who is a bit controversial, but uh, which I have published some papers about. And then I go into the Euthydemid dynasty, which I think is not controversial, uh, and I end them at 175 BC. And then I go on to the Middle Kings, which I discussed in my last. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Eucratides, and I'm also going to show some in the Greek kings, but I'll, I will wait with that. Um, I was given the great honor of uh, contributing to the, the Routledge volume in 19, uh, 2019, and uh, edited by Rachel Maas, which Maas perhaps, which is uh, well, the sta- it, it is the standard volume really, except that it's not a coin catalog, of course. But uh, and there I wrote about the independence of Bactria, and I tried to date it. I'm repeated my numismatical uh, arguments from 2010, which was in the Numismatic Chronicle, but I also added some analysis of the sources, and I found that it was fully possible to um, say that Diodotus I, he seceded from the Seleucids um, in 246 or 5 BC, when there was a catastrophic war with between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, and uh, the Seleucid Empire was almost uh, annihilated. And it was at that time, uh, as I see it, that Diodotus may have uh, uh, seceded. And uh, he did that in that case, well, overnight is a strong word, but quite quickly. The established idea has always to be that the coins issued under the name of Antiochus in um, um, Bactria with the typical diodative uh, thundering series, that they are belong to semi-independent period. But I have discussed that at length in my 2010 paper, which is available for free uh, online since long. So it can could be read. And um, well, um, I'm not going to go too much into detail about how to interpret Justin and Strabo and Polyinus and the Adolis inscription. The latter two are quite unknown, but they both say that when this war began, um, the Silicon Empire bordered on India, which I interpret to mean that, uh, well, Bactria borders on India, so the Bactria was in the Silicon Empire before the war, uh, to simplify it very, very much. Um, but I also went into to some length into talking about um, the coins of Antiochus I and Antiochus II in Bactria, and my opinion is that... <laughs> For the early Seleucid coins, which are not dated and don't have any epithets or so, it's not very easy to realize if a coin is a coin of Antiochus I, he died in 261 BC, is a coin issued before or after his death. Because many means, 
issued posthumous coins, and I think that that was the case in Bactria as well. Um, previously, we have simply had the assumption that when, when he died, and Antiochus II became king, well, then they made a, uh, a new start at uh, the Bactrian mints and started minting coins of Antiochus II immediately. But there's really no proof for that because we don't know. Um, they might well have continued for several years to issue coins of Antiochus I, who was quite popular in the East. He had probably been there as a joint regent, and his coins were widely imitated in Sodion and such places. So we simply don't know. And that means that we cannot say that the scarcity of coins of Antiochus II is proof that Antiochus II, the rule of Antiochus II, was um, interrupted by uh, the auditors. He may have ruled until he died in 246 BC, but his own coins may not have been issued there, just like many other mints issued coins of his popular father. Um, it's, it's a complicated question, to say the least. But this is a very boring page. This merely um, repeats the, the ar arguments that I used in my 2010 um, paper, uh, which say that the Antiochus coins with the thundering Zeus and a portrait that is perhaps of Diodotus I were later than those it's issued in the name of Diodotus I. And we have, it's a rather strong numismatic evidence, we have a bronze mule between an obverse of Antiochus I, second, I'm sorry, and a reverse naming Diodotus. And the thing is here that probably this uh, obverse which was from a gold state. It was just lying around when Diodotus became king, and they said that, but we don't have any uh, obverse ready at the moment, so we can simply use this old one, the silicate, in 246, if I'm correct. Uh, we have no similarities to coin between coins of Antiochus II, his lifetime coinage with uh, Apollon, real silicate coins, and the um, Antiochus coins. On the other hand, um, they are... Um, closely linked to the first coins of the later king, Euthydemus I. They share three monograms and they share uh, very similar portraits. And we also have Dai. Uh, we also have uh, boards with both of these coins where the, the Antiochus coins are more worn, which is an indication, if not forcing, that they are no, less worn, less worn. The Antiochus coins were less worn which is an indication, if not forcing, that they were younger. And we also have a worn dye link, which is very, very special. And the worn dye link means that we have a coin of in the name of Diodotus with a dye, and then we have the same dye, but it's more worn, and thus later, with an Antiochus tetradrachm. And this tarries very badly with the idea that the Antiochus coins were earlier. They were later, because... Well, dice wear out. And then after this, uh, David Singh, uh, he has a Chinese name too, but uh, never mind. David Singh, he f actually found a die link between Euthydemus I and an Antiochus coin, uh, which could be interpreted to mean that Antiochus is king, Antiochus Nicator, he ruled just before Euthydemus. And uh, there were dice of his portraits lying around. And when Euthydemus came to power, the oscillator simply reused one of those dice. It's, uh, of course, it could have been otherwise, but um, dice usually were not saved for very long. And I'm going to, uh, why should you save an old die? It could be used for counterfeiting money, and it, it's good metal that can, can be reused. So these are the, uh, the numismatic uh, evidence that I presented in 2010, and which... I was very happy to hear that thing had uh, added to. So we have these three kings, in my opinion. There are still those who, who disagree. Um, Diodotus I from 246, and ending with um, Antiochus Nicator, who was later commemorated on commemorative coins, but I'm not going to talk about them much today uh, in a date that I tentatively identify with 221, um, but I will return to that. Olivia Badeau, he has been making a dissertation. It is here. And uh, he's critical of this idea 
He is a student of Bobby Ratch here, and I have, of course, oh. contradicted Bobby Ratch. Bobby Ratch was actually wise enough not to go into this matter very deeply. He simply called these coins dilated coins, or coins of Diodotus, the first and second. But uh, what he found, and I think that is a very good example of numismatic research, was that there were two portrait types uh, in the Diodotid dynasty. And uh, we see one of them to the left. And of course, we see one of them to the right. And both these types were issued in the name of Antiochus and Diodotus, if I understand things correctly. Um, you can see how different they are when it comes to hair. It's you have simply two different designs. And we can also perhaps make some assumptions about age. It's not, well, possible. Uh, we can't do that. But uh, as far as I know, um, to the best of my understanding, Olivier Godot means that this means that, well, there are two portrait types, and that means that there were two kings. Uh, I have never claimed that Antiochus uh, Nicator used any individual port portraits that were unique. Many early uh, Hellenistic kings did not do that. And here we look at what Pankaj has found, which was actually one of the staples in my Routledge paper. These are your um, illustrations, Pankaj, uh, from the uh, from the Routledge book. And we see that we have um, the first portrait type to the left. And there we have it. It's not a die link. Be thought so first, but it's not a dialing, but it's very, very similar. And this is used for Euthydemus the first. And Euthydemus the first was clearly a different king. He was not any of the Diodotic kings. So that means how much the engravers cared about the individuality of the portrait at this time. Well, we can have this portrait. We used it for a Diodotic king, and we can use it for Euthydemus the first. And um, so uh, I have been called lazy by uh, uh, Brian Critt, who said that, well, what a simple solution. Portraits don't count. He, he said that explicitly uh, in his book. But, uh, well, uh, portraits were less individual in the early Hellenistic period. And there are still many cases where we fight about which king is really depicted. And uh, here we have such a clear case that they don't mind very much at least not in this case, it may, may have been a makeshift idea that uh, two different kings had a very similar thought. Then we go to the Euthydemid dynasty. Why do I start the Euthydemid dynasty at 221 BC? That's because I cling to a straw that is the only straw there is, and that is Strabon in geography 11.9. And it says that the kings of Syria and Media were fighting with each other when Euthydemus became king in Bactria. And the Strabon's account is not very good here. But uh, the kings of Syria and Media, there was only one king in Media in the third century, and that was Molon, and he rebelled in 221. And this idea was uh, given to me by Jeffrey D. Lerner, uh, who wrote about it all already in the 90s. But uh, well, it's a it's a straw that you can cling to. It's not at all certain, but uh, well, what shall we do? Um, two hundred thirty, two hundred twenty, uh, or try to set a date. It's apparently not very wrong uh, in any way, um, and uh, and then I keep going with the three kings here. I don't date them individually for this purpose or the, or this uh, uh, speech. Uh, Euthydemus the first issued far many many more coins and ruled for a long time apparently. Demetrius was his son, famous from Strabon and other uh, ancient sources, and Canterbury Tales I think also he is in Demetrius the Great, Lord of Ind, and Euthydemus the second was in all likelihood his uh, young son who ruled for a short time. And I have here ended their reign which is also speculation, but uh, somewhere we have to start uh, with uh, the start of the Indo-Greek era, which Yocrib uh, and uh, uh, was it Falk and some others uh, proved actually took place in 175 or BC. They synced it with um, um, 
a later uh, calendar uh, from the first century BC, uh, which is a very interesting uh, discovery as well. But I, I have simply made that, and it's a round number as well, so it, it, it fits reasonably well. 175 BC, and then we have the Indo-Greek era from that, because Indo-Greek Greek Hellenistic eras are always counted from the first year of a king of a dynasty. It's uh, invariably so. It's so for the Seleucids, it's so for the Parthians, it's so for the Bithynians, it's so for the Cappadocians. They count from the first king. Not something they did them themselves, but the first king, their ancestor, because it was status to have ruled for, to belong to a, an ancient dynasty that ruled for long. We can carry on with, no, I'm oh, sorry. There we are. I have to go back. We can carry on with what happened uh, with the um, during the Euthydemid dynasty uh, in terms of coins, and Euthydemus the first he carried on very much in the same way as the Diodotic kings. His mints produced all kinds of coins he has sitting here at least as his reverse. But then during the end of his reign, something happened. Um, the coins became more, the silver coins, the tetradact, became more artistic. I think we can all agree on that. And they seem to depict him, which is not so illogical because he's a, had ruled for a long time, um, as an elderly man with a heavy jowl. Um, and Bopiaraci places these as the last. And there are two circumstances that are very interesting about these last series. Um, I've written exactly what they're called here. They were first, they were not accompanied by gold anymore. There are no gold coins with this old portrait. And secondly, there are imitations by the people li living in Sogdiana, who were saying, uh, which are based on Euthydemus's coins. And they are not, to my, the best of my knowledge, never based on this uh, old type uh, of portrait. And this is evidence that Sogdiana was lost, because Polybius says, uh, 1134, that um, the, the nomads were at the borders of Bactria, which means that Sogdiana in the north had been conquered by the nomads. And these are three very interesting coincidences, if they are coincidences, but I think that we can say that with some certainty, that the nomads advanced further south, and the Greeks lost their control over Sogdiana, and perhaps they lost resources for gold then. Um, and the imitations, of course, these coins didn't circulate in Sogdiana because Euthydemus didn't rule there anymore. So what then? The reason for this crisis was the siege by the Seleucid king Antiochus the Great. And this siege and the campaign against Bactria is uh, quite famous, and it took place in 208 to 206 BC. And uh, eventually, Antiochus the Great failed to conquer the Euthydemid dynasty. He settled for a marriage alliance, also very interesting, but I won't go into that now, and a gift of elephants. And then he went west again, and he was defeated by the Romans. And you all know what happened to the Seleucids after that. Um, when Euthydemus was besieged, or at that time, he mint, probably minted all his gold reserves. That's standard procedure for a besieged king. Get your money out because before someone takes it and pay your soldiers. Um, and the pro production of portrait models, which Crit talks about quite a lot, was centralized, which is not so strange because you are in the capital and that's where the coins are made. And uh, this centralization of portrait models led to these very fine portraits. And uh, Francis Marchini, which Joseph, uh, whom I met in Reading in 2016, where I also met you, Jo, uh, Jo Krib, uh, proved in her speech that Demetrius' uh, mints, they were very meticulous about the exact weight, the exact high weight, I should say, of the tetragram. And they were quite artistic. They are among the most sought after coins. And uh, I think that perhaps we could say that there wasn't any gold anymore available for Demetrius. Um, he didn't issue any gold coins. Uh, so that 
the chapter that became the prestige issue, and they were served as a more important focus for propaganda, and they were also like, well, they had very reliable weight so that people could trust them. Um, they become important. And this ushers in the heyday of Bactrian uh, portraiture. All these things happen at the same time. What is the exact reason? I don't know. But uh, this relies on several um, uh, papers and uh, dissertations and so on that uh, these things happened at the same time. Uh, the, so Diana was lost, gold was lost, the chapter that became artistic, and the weight became very reliable. And here we have one of these coins also from Pankai's, I think it's his personal specimen of Demetrius. And uh, well, we can also see that he has, he is a bit of a heavyweight, if we can trust this portrait. Uh, so. It's at least at more individual coinage than before. If it's realistic, well, we can talk about that some other time. Among the later kings, the only king who issued gold in any substantial amount, the only king in Bactria, uh, there are very, very few in the Greek um, gold coins, uh, and some of them are dubious. Um, but uh, the only king, Eucratides, issued lots of gold. And it's hard not to see a connection with uh, his conquests. He fought many wars in all directions, uh, Eucratides, and his coins have been found in Iran and, and further west and imitated in Babylonia and so on. So Eucratides, he held many territories and he probably had access to gold. He apparently had access to gold. The moment he died and the moment Icanum was uh, plundered and raised to the ground, Gold disappears forever from Bactria. Uh, the, the later kings, there is not a single gold coin among them. Uh, which also speaks in favor of the idea that the, the Bactrians in, uh, uh, took their gold from the north in Sogdia. The Sogdiana, I would say. Then there was another thing. The king started at to add epiclesis or epithets to their names. They call themselves like God or Theos or Soter, Savior or Dikaios, the just uh, or Aniketos, like Demetrius, the invincible and so on. And um, this happened first, we think, on the commemorative coins. But when we also have the title Basileus and we have an extra epithet, this calls for a long, this gives a long longer legend and it means that we have uh, some problem fitting it all into onto the flam and this is even so more so for the indo greek kings who issued uh, smaller coins they issued uh, well drachs uh, indian drachs which are roughly four seventh of uh, an attic drachm i think and uh, it is it gets very very clamped and you have to do some tricks to get place for these uh, all these words, and um, that means that they had to write the coins in a round, uh, the legends in a rounded way instead of writing them straight, as we have seen on the earlier coins, because that makes more space. But it also is an abstraction. I mean, if you read a book, we have straight lines here. If I were to make these uh, lines into a panoply, like a rainbow. They would be harder to, to read, and a person who had never re read anything but straight lines would perhaps be confused. So it's like a, a little leap of faith. You have to uh, have, have a deeper, more abstract understanding of reading to comprehend those king coins. Here we have them. The first coins written around were continuous, which means that you had to turn the coin like a wheel to read it. And there were, this is of course the Karoshti legend on Indo Greek, which is read from uh, uh, right to left in the opposite direction. And uh, then we have Eucratides, who had a canopy and a straight legend, and uh, the opposite on his Indo Greek coins in Karoshti. And then we have the final legend where we have an upper canopy and a lower, well, I don't want to call it a canopy, a reverse canopy, perhaps. Um, uh, but we have a bilingual, um, a bidirectional coin, and this coin, 
this is the legend that is found on almost all modern coins, I suppose. I mean, if you have some spare change, you can simply look at it. And, yeah, that's how it looks. And uh, the Indo-Greeks apparently in, invented this uh, independently because I've never seen it properly executed on a Roman coin. I've uh, seen almost on Ptolemaic coins, but it was an invention that I made uh, in the how to make room for more words and coins without having to turn them. And uh, at some later time, this invention was made again. It's uh, the most advanced script in the world at this time um, on court. And this is also used for dating, of course, because the bidirectional coins were later. Now we will have a very, very small moment uh, for audience participation here. Uh, we have three objects here. The first of them is a gold stator of Eucrates the Great, and we see this panoply legend here. And then we have the Eucratidian medal. It weighs 169 grams, and it's in France in the Louvre Museum. I, the French coin cabinet, uh, I think it is. Uh, uh, and this one weighs about, well, 10 grams or something. This one weighs 169 grams. And uh, it's uh, the same portrait, and the reverse is also the same. And then we have the Barberini ivory, which is a consular triptych. It's made of marble, and it was made somewhere along 500 AD. We don't know which emperor it belongs to. And I was thinking that we should do a little game of odd one out here. Um, one of these three doesn't fit with the others. And um, you are so welcome to um, give your suggestions about which one doesn't fit. The gold stator, the medal, the ivory. I mean, the, the obviously the obvious answer is the marble is the but but given that you're asking the question, it has to be one of the other two. <laughs> uh, uh, um, Panke is of course completely right. The, the marble ivory is different from the other ones, which are both made at a mint. But you can think differently. And why did I take this one away? Because the Byzantine Barbary Barberini ivory and the Eucratidas medal, 169 grams, they are prestige objects. They are not everyday objects. A gold coin is not an everyday object, but uh, you, you know what I mean. They are diplomatic gifts or similar. Each specimen of these were taken, produced by the court individually and given to a certain person, a diplomat, foreign ruler, a general, or something like that. But the Eucratidas gold statue is a coin its production is technically similar to the Eucratidian, but its function, uh, I, I say I phrased myself uh, right here, uh, wrong here. Its function, uh, uh, the Eucratidian's function is more similar to the Barberini ivory. This is something that the court gave to um, somebody for um, a specific reason. Or celebration of a war one or something like that. So these two are quite, uh, they serve the same function in a way, even if they are made with very different techniques. There is of course not an absolute wrong or right here, I mean, uh, apparently, but it, it, it's a, some food for thought. The Eucratidians reverse has been engraved from, re-engraved from a straight arrangement, and we have the re-engraving somewhere here, and it has been very badly done. It was originally in a straight line, but the letters got cramped. And when you, Bopiracci realized this uh, and understood this, he researched this uh, medal, he thought that, well, uh, you can see this early coins were straight, and then they were rounded because the word megalo was added, the epiclesis, and uh, this must have been the first coin that Eucratides uh, released when he was um, yeah. became great king, which is what it means. So it took it. And as this monogram, as another monogram, um, also appeared on his Indian coins, because Eucratides made conquests in India, 
then Bopiraci made the conclusion that Eucratides had conquered India in circa 60, 162 BC. And then he took it from there, which is a very good numismatic analysis, I would say. But uh, soon after, that turned up that there were actually regular coins of Eucratides, which had the Epiclesis Megas and were cramped and had a straight line. They are not, they're quite rare. Um, and apparently it was less difficult to space out many letters on the large Germidalium flam. And um, the rounded legend, which was the final design, was imitated by Timarchus, and I have written about that as well. It's here. He issued such coins in Babylonia. They imitate uh, Eucratides almost exactly, except for the bull's horn for some reason. Otherwise, they are just copies. And um, they are from circa 160, uh, I would say. Um, I wrote a paper about that too. But since I don't see the Eucratidian medallion as a coin, and I discussed this with uh, Professor Frank Holt, it's not necessary that it followed, its dice followed the rules of regular dice. The regular dice are workman's tools, they are worn out and perhaps discarded and so on. We have many dice, but there was never more than one set of dice for this enormous medallion um, and so on. And uh, I think that it's fully possible that the dice were saved and then they were kept at the court because at some other time there might arise a need to strike another medallion uh, for another war, for another diplomat, or so on. And they could have gone many years. And at that time, we have moved into this superior final design, and it may have re-engraved at a later time, and even had a new monogram, because it's the re-engraver was perhaps not the same person or same workshop who had engraved the first. We, what I'm saying is that I, if we don't apply the rules of coins to this medallion, it is uh, hard to date it. And uh, this uh, coin that we see, uh, medallion that we see, would then have been the second version, Eucratidion Mark II. It's such a, a unique object uh, that we may not be able to, uh, well, say that. Uh, uh, it's it's dice. It it followed the, the rules of regular coins, which is of course a, a production process. But uh, where there are few extravagances. Oh, uh, and uh, I will not go into this very much. I will simply leave the page here. Uh, the Heliopolis and Laodice coins are written about them too, but they are after one hundred fifty. I think that they are uh, follow uh, followed Eucratides and uh, that they are commemorating him instead of the other way around. Um, and I've written about this as well, but uh, I think it's time to move on uh, to different things here, because I've actually said that 150 BC is the last date. So we can summarize, return briefly to our uh, chart here. The Diodotids, the Euthydemids, the Middle Kings, who some of them competed with Eucratides before he came to power, he eventually prevailed. Uh, his accession in 165 is, according to Justin, same time as Mithridates the first of Parthia. And uh, Ellen Wilson and Geir of Asser wrote about this. Asser had found some uh, cuneiform documents, I think, which uh, uh, confirmed that Mithridates came to power in 165. As for the ending, I used the famous year 24, which was on an amphora when Iconon was destroyed. And, uh, well, it's a guess work that as well, but Eucratidus had a long reign. And if we use that, we land at 142. Uh, I, I certainly don't claim to, that these are exact dates, but I mean, I, when I do a timeline, I space kings out so that they can take a place that is appropriate for them. Um, the point is that if, if modern scholars don't do that, then the those who write over, uh, I mean, like introductory works, they will use older uh, sources, which are often more exact, even if they are completely wrong. So um, I'm not sure I would publish this in a peer-reviewed paper, but uh, this is the kind, kind more, more of a kind of 
sensitive working model, which could be questioned at so many levels, um, actually. Indogrids, I talked about her, Pantaleon and Agathocles, and the point is that I think that Pantaleon was joint regent a few years into the reign of Euthydemus II. So I've simply given it them um, uh, a straight 10 years between them. The same goes here. And then we have Apollodotus I, who was the first Indic Greek king not to rule in Bactria at all. And he probably ruled farthest from Bactria. It makes sense. Gandhara, then he perhaps took over in Parapomisidae. Um, and he is almost impossible to date because we can at least compare the other in, in Greek or Bactrian kings to one another. But he had his own weight standard from the beginning. He had his own shape of coins, square, silver, and so on. So there are no overstrikes. And we don't know how large his kingdom was, and we don't, many of them don't have monograms and so on. And many, they didn't use fully Hellenized techniques. Uh, they relied on very much an Indian designs. So it's, we can't compare them to any, anything. So it's very, very difficult to say, did he rule for 15 years or 25 or something like that? Um, well, it's, it's very hard, much harder for him than anyone else. Um, the next king is Antimachus II, or perhaps the son of Antimachus I, uh, but he ruled in India. I would say no more than a decade because his coins are quite scarce. Um, I, I will hold it at that. And he begins a complete new coinage, which is round, round silver. And um, he has three monogram groups. One has four monograms. They are just variations. One has three. One has one. And Menander, on his earliest coins, inherits one from each group, which means that uh, possibly that these three groups accept, existed at the same time. And what can we make out of that? Well, we can say that he had perhaps three workshops. Means uh, workshops. Possibly we could say that. Um, so. And then we have Eucratides, and Eucratides goes into India at some point during his reign, and he issues... Uh, Rare silver, but lots of bronzes. But some of these bronzes bear me posthumous. And they have a bidirectional uh, legend, but not uh, um, exactly like uh, Menander had. I have written about these, this very complicated conflict, and I think that it's this is perhaps not the time to go into that, because it is extremely complicated. I would not say that I understand it, and there are many alternative positive possibilities. But Eucratides advanced into India. We have Justin talking about the king Demetrius, the king of the Indians, who besieged him but eventually failed. And me and Ellen Wilson and some other scholars have identified this king, perhaps with Demetrius III and Iketos, who issued very few coins, uh, but looked like Demetrius I, uh, on his bronzes at least. And he was probably supported by Menander, who became the leading king, and he survived Eucratides, and then he made um, conquests in India, which are talked about in, uh, well, in Western sources as well as um, actually uh, an Indian religious script, the Melinda Pana, where he's also said to have become a Buddhist monk. Well, I don't have to, you don't have to believe that, but if it was Menander the first who was Melinda, it's, there are some arguments about that too. And what I will leave you with finally is the uncertainty about Menander's dating Menander, because that is something that I'm really concerned about. Um, and where I think that there is uncertainty. Um, Bopiraci said that, uh, well, since Eucratides uh, issued the gold medallion in 162 or so, and uh, Menander soon started copying uh, Eucratides. Uh, bidirectional legends. Uh, he, Menander originally had continuous legends. That means that Menander must have ruled at that time and he started copying those legends in, well, the 150s. So he says that Menander ruled from 165. But that idea forces... Uh, it, there isn't much time before in the Indigree Kingdom to say that if Menander was that early. So uh, Menander 
Bobby Ratchet then says that Apple Order was the first and Ubuntu Mac was the second, but contemporaries instead of ruling um, after one another. But this isn't, they didn't rule two different kingdoms because their coins are almost invariably found together. I have looked at Senior, Robert Senior had a place with like 24 hordes, and in all of the hordes where one of them existed, the other one's coins were as well. So they should have ruled the same territory. I think that's uh, um, very hard to argue against. That's uh, something that I've been working with for at least 10 years, this complicated problems. Then we have Bobby Ratchet's old age, which I think might be also an arranged state. I'm not sure. Um, 155, good middle date, um, which allows for Apple Auditors to rule before Antimacos. And these are all from Bobby Ratchet's 1991 catalog B and backed. And here we have a continuous legend, difficult to read. And the same for the Karosti. If you can read Karosti, and here we have the bidirectional, which is like any other modern coin. The name here, King, Sorter, and the same if mirrored on the Karosti side. Genius. And then there is this radical idea that Menander may have been as late as 145 BC. And why would this idea be presented at all? Well, this takes into account the second. Um, um, document we have with the dating, and it's a dating of King Antimachus, and we have a date, no, the third actually, uh, we have a dating back to tax receipt with Antimachus the first ruling in year four. So year 30, it can't be Antimachus the first, it has to be Antimachus the second. And if this is the Indo-Greek era, which started in 175 BC, we are now in 146 BC. If we assume that this is the Indo-Greek era in the Amphipolis document, which is a payment for some uh, Scythian nomad soldiers, uh, cavalry. And if Antimachus the second ruled then, well, then Menander, at least his sole reign, must have begun later, which means 145 BC. And this is radical. And I'm, say I'm not saying that I'm really promoting it, but uh, on the other hand, I cannot see that there are any absolute uh, restraints uh, or obstacles against it. The only thing that I can say is that Menander's coinage is so numerous that we have to move his uh, date, uh, his death to somewhere after 130, which is the standard date for, this, uh, for his death. Well, we leave the chronology on this uncertain note because I think that there is more, very much, Many more studies need to be done on this um, very complicated period. Um, and I hope to continue such a paper one day. But I think I will start with a very small paper where I take this one. Should present some new coins, of course. Uh, this is um, the good C.A. Bushan Kapadia, who is a very keen uh, uh, numismatist. And he has found another overstrike of Menander over Soilus I, who was a later king uh, and who ruled at the later period, at the last period of this very confused conflict. And, uh, well, he simply found Soilus' uh, Epiclesis here, Dicaius, the just. And uh, I think that this is the fourth. Uh, overstrike of Menander over uh, Soilus, and it's uh, very good for dating, uh, um, especially very good for dating Menander's coinage, and it changes made to them, and for dating Soilus uh, as well. So I hope that I will publish this along with another overstrike of the same type that uh, C.A. Bishan Kapadia found. And uh, a little, little curiosity here. This is Menander's very famous um, um, attic um, tetradachum. He issued some of those. And uh, it's from your, uh, your uh, uh, site, Pankanch. Do you own that coin? Yes, I do. Yes, that's fantastic. I don't, I don't know how many there are. Less than 10, I suppose. It's really fantastic. 
But this design is a contamination. Um, we can see on the early coins of Menander that uh, Athena, who's standing here, she holds Medusa's head. And she holds it on an upstretched arm because she is, uh, you know, it petrifies enemies. And so you can hold it up and they will be petrified, flying enemies and so on, um, demons and whatever she was fighting. Uh, but a shield, this is a Macedonian, heavy Macedonian shield, or Greek shield, I should say. That's not something that you hold on an outstretched arm. It doesn't do the least good. You hold it at an angle. Which, when uh, Menander changed from Athena's, um, changed Athena's attire from uh, the Medusa head to the shield, um, he, the first coins, held the shield in a realistic angle, like you should hold a shield. But this coin holds it just like the Medusa head. And why? Well, it's obviously because there are, as we have said, three words in the legend. And um, this is uh, the old fashioned method with straight letters. So we have Basileus Sotros here, and we have a very thin Athena, and she holds the shield all the way up so we can fit the name below the shield. And this is a contamination. I have seen almost upraised shields in the West, but not this high. And this should mean that the pose in question was actually created for this coin to fit with this extraordinary design, um, old-fashioned. Um, why Menandus Agravis used that, I don't know. We could have made a rounded. We did that from our own other coins. <coughs> uh, so um, I think that this coin could be safely placed as the first series of all the uh, coins that um, have Athena with raised shield, which are Menander's later coins. And this is a bit of a parallel case to the Eucratidian and how we can discuss how it affected the design of the um, legends of um, Eucratides. Um, but that's that's a very small, very small observation. I don't know if, I, if it's worth public to see or something. Still, it's rather funny to see this very, very slim Athena holding a shield up in an impossible at an impossible angle, just so that we can have the legend in the old fashioned way, even though there are three words. So Jens, I'd like to thank you again very much for uh, this very, very interesting presentation. I